Mordecai bowed not, nor did it reverence. Then was Haman full of wrath, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. <clears throat> Uh, for they had shown him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Verse 7. In the first month, in the first month, is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast lots, or per, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is, the month of Adar. And Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your, your kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, neither do they keep the king's laws, therefore it's not for the king's prophet to suffer them or to allow them to live. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Okay? Haman's making a proposition to King Ahasuerus. These people are no good, these Jews. They don't bow down. They're not like us. And I think it's best that we just wipe them out. Okay? And a matter of fact, I'm willing to pay, I believe the number is uh, like dollars in silver to help to get rid of these people. Uh, but Let's continue to read, okay? Verse 10. The king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said to Haman, the silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to thee. Then the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded to the king's lieutenants, to the governor that were over every province. And to the, the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, as it is written, and sealed with the king's ring. The letters were sent by post to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women. In one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take spoil of them for a prey. They even set the day, they cast lots, actually Haman cast lots to decide which day it was going to happen, and literally it was like throwing dice, okay, and it turned out that it was going to be about 11 months away, okay, that this was going to happen, and it was written out by king's decree, signed with his ring, okay, the, the king of Persia, and so uh, the king really didn't understand what he was doing, he was just letting Haman uh, have his way with him, okay, and so Verse 14, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published to all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. Skip on to chapter 4. Then called Esther for ha verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5. Then called Esther for Hatach, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatach went forth to Mordecai to the street of the city, which was before the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree, which was given at Shushan to destroy them to show it to Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go into the king to make supplication to him, to make requests before him for her people. Esther had ascended to the position of queen and she was a Jew. They didn't know she was a Jew. We'll get to that in a little bit, okay? But her cousin Mordecai is sitting outside the city gate. He knows what Haman's plans are. He knows the king's approved of it. He knows that he's got the, uh, the, the authority of the king and they've already set a day. And Mordecai is saying, Esther, you got to do something about this. You're going to have to go in and talk to the king. You have to get things straightened out. Or else we're all going to be destroyed. All the Jews throughout the whole province of, of uh, uh, Persia. And so that's, by the way, that's modern day Iran. Okay? That's, that's the Iran, modern day Iranians. Okay? So if you wonder why the Iranians 
hate the Jews today. It, it's a historical thing that goes way, way, way back and it, uh, clear, clear to Esau. But uh, they want to destroy the Jews. But every time anybody was attempted to, try, to destroy the Jews, they've always found out it was a huge mistake. And the net result is God turns the tables on them and they end up suffering the very thing that they would have wanted to happen to God's people. All right. And so verse 13 of that same chapter 4, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. Neither eat or drink for three days, night or day. I also and my, aiden, my maidens will fast likewise, and will go, I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And then she closes her comments to Mordecai, and she says, if I perish, I perish. In other words, she was going to lay down her life uh, for her people in order that they might be spared. God is working behind the scenes. Queen Esther and her cousin Mordecai, in order to save the Jews who are on, really on the verge of total extermination. Okay? It's always been Satan's desire to attack God's people, whether it's the Old Testament saints, God's people in, in the wilderness, and those in captivity, and those who went back to try to rebuild the temple, and they actually did, or the New Testament saints. God's, God's activity in our lives uh, the devil is always trying to do something to cause harm, to destroy, to disrupt, to silence, to thwart the work of God in the lives of God's people. That is, that is his goal, is to stop the work that God is doing. Jerusalem had fallen to Babylon. The Jews had been exiled. It was about 605. Babylon eventually gave way to Persia, to the Persian Empire, and that was about 539 B.C., Daniel uh, as, as survived the Babylonian captivity and he ended up serving in the court of the, the new king of Persia. Uh, while they were still in captivity, uh, uh, the Medes and the Persians came in and they wiped out the Babylonians and they took charge. And you, you have in captivity there tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews that have been there for seven, uh, 70 years, okay? God has already said, okay, your punishment's over with, okay? He revealed it to Daniel. The 70 years is over with. God brings discipline on his people when they disobey, okay? So one of the first things we really need to understand is God wants us to, to willingly obey him, and if we don't, there's going to be a consequence, and there's going to be discipline. God's not going to wipe out his people, okay? He, he's promised he's not going to do that. But as a child of God, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, God expects us to behave differently than we did before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. When God's people were uh, delivered out of Egypt, God expected his people to be different. And he gave him his law in, in Exodus chapter 20. And Moses gave it to the people. And then he said, here's the promised land that I'm, I'm going to give you. Go in and possess it. Well, they decided, no, we're not strong enough to possess it, even though there was probably two and a half million Jews, by the way, that came out of Egypt into uh, the desert, into the wilderness. And then when God said, I'm going to give you this land, they wouldn't do it. They would, they would have nothing of it. So when they eventually end up in the promised land under Joshua, they settle the land and they, ha they have a period of time of judges, which your Bible uh, speaks about all the judges of the nation of Israel, the people would sin, and then uh, God, would, they would, God would bring discipline, and then uh, they would cry out to God, and God would deliver them. That was the history of the judges as they're in the promised land. Well, uh, eventually, uh, they decided they wanted a king. We know that uh, uh, they rejected God as their king, and so uh, they chose uh, Saul. Uh, God, God chose Saul, and Saul ended up becoming disqualified, eventually David. And David uh, uh, ruled over Israel for 40-some years, and he wanted to build uh, a tabernacle to God. 
And God said, there's blood, too much blood on your hands. And he said, it's going to go to your son. So Solomon ended up building the temple. Okay. And then eventually that temple ends up getting destroyed and the people of God end up going into captivity. Here's where we are. We're coming. We've spent 70 years in captivity. God's people have been disciplined and now they're going to start living like God expects them to. And God says, go back into the land. I'm going to free you. So you go back in and worship me. And so uh, we find that Esther is, um, is, is in Persia at this time. Uh, Daniel uh, survived the Babylonian uh, rule. By the time of Hazarus, he's also, your Bible might say Xerxes, okay? Uh, in Esther, Daniel is already gone, and Haman actually became the prime minister of Persia. He, Haman was Ag Agagite, and I'll get into detail on that in a few minutes, okay? But uh, Haman was made the prime minister of Persia. He was under the king. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Haman hates the Jews, okay? He hates God's people. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadat, Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set him in his seat above all the princes that were with him, okay? And so we find out how this man gets in power, okay? He probably said all the right things to make the king feel comfortable, went in and got, would, would get drunk with the king, and, and uh, uh, the net result was he became a real good friend, and so he... he uh, gave him this position of authority and, and rulership in Persia. But there was a young woman whose name is Hadassah. Actually, her, uh, her Hebrew name was Hadassah, but her Persian name is Esther. She was orphaned, okay? And she was raised by her uncle, and his name is Mordecai, just to set the table. Mordecai worked for the king in the palace, okay? And uh, even though he was a Jew, he was recognized as a Jew. He was one of the captivity. Uh, he was allowed to serve in the palace, even as Daniel was allowed to serve in the palace, even though he was a Jew. But if you look uh, chapter 2 and verse 5, we see how Mordecai uh, got this position. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, he was a Benjamite, okay, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. And the book of Esther stretches a period of time from 479 to 473. And so Haman is mentioned as an Agagite. Uh, Agag had been the king of the Amalekites. God commanded Saul, Israel's king, to destroy uh, uh, all the Amalekites, okay? And guess what? Saul didn't do it. All right, and the net the net result was uh, uh, he had some descendants, and Saul conquered Amalek, but he didn't kill Agag, and Samuel the prophet showed up and he hacked Agag to pieces, literally cut it in pieces. First Samuel 15. Okay, and so you get a little bit of history. Uh, it's been 500 years since that happened, but it's sort of like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Okay, the Jews uh, despise. The, uh, <laughs> the Amalekites, okay? And the Amalekites despise the Jews. And this feud's been going on for like 500 years. And uh, Haman remembers what happened to his ancestor. He knows that the Jews did it. And so now he's going to put that on uh, Mordecai. And he's going to try to figure out a way to get even for what happened to his family, okay? With a history like that between Israel and in Agag, Haman had a lot of reason to hate the Jews. But in the context of all the other scripture, <clears throat> uh, Esther would have come somewhere between Ezra's writing chapter 6 and chapter 7, and the Jews begin to travel back to Jerusalem in Ezra chapter 7. So if you take Ezra, the, the writing of Ezra, and see where this historically is taking place, you would set it right in between Ezra chapter 6 and 7. As Queen Esther and Mordecai were contemporaries of Ezra and Nehemiah, it isn't uh, hard to understand why Hazarus was favorable to the Jewish people and their return to Jerusalem. Okay, So the, God raised up the, the Persians to release and to let his people go back into Jerusalem to, to worship him. And Ahasuerus selects Esther, she's a Jew, to be a queen, 
after he becomes upset with his current wife. His current wife's name is Vashti, okay? And he's having a, uh, a banquet, and he's got all of his uh, leaders at this banquet, and he's celebrating his great victory. And the net result is, uh, at the end of 180 days of showing all of what he has, they have a seven-day feast, and everybody's pretty much uh, wasted, okay? And uh, what happens is... Uh, um, King Ahasuerus wants Vashti to come in and to parade herself in front of all of his, uh, his leaders, okay? Uh, look at uh, uh, Esther 1 and verse uh, 10. <clears throat> On the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Vista, Harbana, Bigtha, Abagtha, I had to say all these, didn't I? And the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, <clears throat> to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. Well, Vashti was a very noble wife, okay? And she refused the king to be paraded in front of all these drunken, drunken guys. And some say that they, the, the suggestion here is that she should just show up with just her tiara on her head and nothing else, uh, there's nothing in Scripture to say that that's exactly what uh, um, Ahasuerus was asking. But uh, the net result is, she said, ain't going to happen. I'm not going to do that. She refused him. And because she refused him, uh, there was a problem, okay? And uh, he, uh, he had a choice. Uh, he could either uh, put her to death or just put her away. And instead, he just put her away. He didn't put her to death. And... <clears throat> The next thing that happened is, throughout the kingdom, they were in search for someone to, to replace Vashti, okay, as, as the, the wife, the, the queen to Ahasuerus. And they ended up uh, looking throughout the whole kingdom for a replacement, and the replacement ends up being uh, Esther, okay? And <clears throat> we, we discover that uh, when Esther becomes the queen, um, she finds favor with the king, okay? And uh, the Persian king selects Esther to be his queen. And uh, Mordecai, who's like the father to Esther, hears of a plot to kill the king, and he reports it to Esther, and it saves the king's life. And that's in chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. Um, Long story short, in, in, in God's economy, even though God isn't actually visibly present, God is at work in the midst of his people. And Mordecai is God's man on the scene, and Esther is God's woman in the palace. And Esther was not to tell anybody that she was a Jew, because had she told them that she was a Jew, it might have been a problem. The people in Persia really didn't like the Jews. They really kind of hated and despised the Jews. You know, we've got a consensus today. There's a group of people, even in our country today, that seem to have a, a, a real uh, negative attitude towards the Jewish people, even a hatred towards the Jews. And we know that that kind of attitude uh, was prominent during World War II with uh, Hitler and Nazism when Hitler tried to wipe out all the Jews. This is uh, the, the Hitler of the Old Testament right here. Haman is going to try to wipe out all the Jews simply because Mordecai would not bow before him. And Mordecai had a reason not to bow before him. And it has to do with what he believed God's word says. And God's word tells um, Mordecai that he's not to bow before anyone. If you look at the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, I'm going to turn there real quick. Mordecai refused to bow before this wicked Haman. And here's the reason he did this. In, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 1, 
And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You see, Mordecai was a Jew. And even though he'd been in captivity, even though he was working for the king at the city gate, he was not going to bow before this wicked man, Haman. And I'm sure that uh, maybe in the back of Mordecai's mind was the fact that uh, uh, Saul, did, Saul his, his ancestor, was the, the cause that uh, this wicked Haman, is, his Agagite, is still living, okay? And he should have been wiped out because God said he was going to wipe out the memory of the Amalekites because of uh, what they did to the Jews. And so here's this battle going on, but Haman's got the upper hand, so he thinks. And so Haman goes in, and because Mordecai wouldn't bow before him, he tells the king, you know what? There's some people that live in our midst that don't have our customs and they don't worship like we do. They don't practice the things that we do. And you know what? They don't obey your commands, king. Uh, remember the commandment you gave that everybody's supposed to bow before me? Well, this guy, uh, Mordecai, he's not bowing. And his people, they don't bow. They, they don't follow the same customs. And so I'm going to ask you today, king, and I'm, I'm going to be willing to put a bunch of money into your treasury in order to make this happen, okay? And... He promises to put $20 million worth of silver into the king's treasury if he'll sign this decree to wipe out all the Jews. And he even gives him a time frame. And the king is half drunk, I'm sure. And he says, wow, that's a lot of money. That was about two-thirds of his annual income throughout the, the whole kingdom. And so he says, here's my ring. He took off his signet ring and handed it to, handed it to Haman and says, Go ahead and, and make the decree and make sure everybody in the whole kingdom hears about it that on this day, at this particular time, all the Jews are to die. And so you have to wonder, what was the king thinking? First of all, he didn't know that his queen was a Jew, okay? Because this would have affected his own household. But he went ahead and did it. I think he was greedy. I think he was drunk. And I think he wasn't in his right mind, okay? And... Um, there was, there was some others who uh, simply did similar things. I think about the three Hebrew children in Babylon earlier on, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were told that they had to bow whenever they heard the, uh, to, to the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had, had established. And if they didn't, whoever didn't bow would be thrown into what? The fiery furnace, right? Well, they wouldn't bow. And they wouldn't bow. Why? Because they were Jews. Because Jews don't do that. They only worship one God, and they don't bow before anybody else, okay? And so their life was on the line. And they said to Nebuchadnezzar, regardless of what your penalty is, you know, our God's able to deliver us, but if he doesn't, it's okay. We're still not going to bow before your statue. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, right, in Daniel. And so here we're a little bit down the road, and we're finding out that Mordecai is being accused of not... Daniel was, was accused, you know, of praying to uh, the, the Lord his God. And he, and he did it every single day. He went up to his, to his house, and he, he prayed, and, and there, was a, there was a decree that said no one can pray to any other god uh, but Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel went ahead and prayed, just like he had done before. And what happened to Daniel? He was thrown in the, the den of hungry lions, right? Well, what happened? God shut the mouth of the lions. So every time God's people have obeyed God and dared to do what was the right thing before God, God delivered them, okay? And so here you have uh, Haman who thinks he's got Mordecai in a trap, okay? And ultimately, um, he... Uh, decides that he's going to uh, build a gallows to hang Mordecai on, okay? Because he hates Mordecai so bad. He, he has such a terrible hatred in his heart. 
Haman is, is, is not only a picture of, of, of like a, a, a Hitler, okay, but he's, he's really the antipathy. He's a type of the devil. The devil wants to do what to God's people? To steal, kill, and to destroy, okay? That's, that's what Jesus said. The thief comes but not for to kill, to steal, and destroy. Jesus said, but I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, okay? The, the devil, uh, Peter says, your adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, okay? And, and James says in, in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But this man is energized by the devil. This man is sort of like the devil incarnate. He's almost like a Judas. He's, he's actually a, a pre-type of the end times uh, Antichrist is who he is. That's who Haman is. And he wants vengeance for what happened. Something happened hundreds of years before, and he wants to take it out on, on Mordecai, particularly, and on the Jewish people in general. Want to wipe them all out. And yet, what does God's word say about the Jewish people? He, he says that no one is to touch the apple of his eye. He says that in, when he made the promise to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, he says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those that curse you. And all, through you, all the, uh, the families of the earth are going to be blessed through Abraham and through his seed. And so we see the devil trying to stop uh, the coming of the Messiah, ultimately. First, he, he, brought, he, he, he worked through uh, the death of all the, uh, the children when the, when the Jews were in Egypt by causing them to be thrown into the to the river and drowning them okay attack against the kids okay and then when jesus comes uh, herod moves against every two-year-old and and down in order to to wipe out all of the the potential uh king the the, the this newborn king that's coming okay jesus had been born at that time and he, he wanted to wipe him out and he wanted to wipe him out so there'd be no uh, no threat to his kingdom and ultimately, the devil wanted to wipe them out to stop the Messiah from coming. And so Haman wanted to wipe out these Jews early on so they could stop the Messiah from coming. So you see the connection here. Haman doesn't get it, but the devil's using Haman, and he's hatched this plan, and he builds these gallows. They're 75 feet high, and he says, I'm going to take Mordecai out. I'm going to kill him, okay? Matter of fact, his wife is the one who told him to do it, okay? If you look in uh, Esther chapter 5, and uh, we, we see here in, um, right towards uh, the end of it, um, <clears throat> verse 12, Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king, unto the banquet, but she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow am I invited to her also with the king. I got an invitation from Esther. She's invited me to come in to be with her at a feast with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. He said, this doesn't even help me. I, I, I'm number one in the kingdom. He said, I'm next to the king himself. He said, but that's not good enough. Mordecai still, he, he gets under my skin and he won't bow to me. And so no matter what happens, I'm not happy. And then verse 14, then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends to him, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high. Tomorrow speak thou to the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then there go thou in merrily with the king to the banquet. And a thing pleased Haman and caused the gallows to be made. Okay, so here you are. He's already got a decree to wipe out all the Jews. Okay, but it's not good enough. He wants to do away with Mordecai right now. And the Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, guess what he wants to do? He wants to wipe out the Jews, okay? Uh, in the middle of the agreement that he makes uh, with them for protection, okay, what does he do? He goes into the temple and he wants to be worshipped. What does Haman want? He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be recognized. He wants to be exalted, okay? And that's 
kind of the, the whole idea behind a satanic activity, somebody who wants to be exalted to a position that's higher than everybody else. That's exactly what Lucifer did from the very beginning. He wanted to, to be exalted to the position of God's throne. He wanted to take over God's throne, okay? And so here he's living it out to this man named Haman, and Haman's got this all figured out now. The Jews are all going to be dead. I'm going to get rid of Mordecai tomorrow. The king's going to give me permission. And guess what? The, his wife has invited me to a banquet. <laughs> he doesn't understand that the banquet that he's invited to is the banquet where Esther is going to uh, actually reveal to the king that there's been a wicked plot hatched to kill all should be done to this wicked Haman. And Haman went and threw himself on a sofa and he's crying out to Esther now. Now he's fearful. Now he's scared. Okay? And he says, you know, please, please. And, and his, his servant, 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 his So the very thing, go, first of all, uh, Esther has declared that she's going to go in and talk to the king. And even though she's not supposed to, without an invitation, in, in this particular period of time, you didn't just walk in and talk to the king, even though she's your husband, you just going to see. And unless he extends his golden scepter to you, if you walk into his presence, you could be, you could be put to death immediately. And the, the reason they have something that is crazy, you never know who's going to try to put him to death, who's going to try to assassinate him. And so he only held out that scepter to somebody who had a reason to come into his presence. He, he had already been attempted assassination of Ellen Church of Christ. If it wasn't for Mordecai, he would already be dead because Mordecai brought it to the attention of him early on. And so the net result is he hasn't extended the scepter to his wife. And Esther's concerned if I do this, I might be put to death. And Mordecai says to her, maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time. Only one person that can undo what's done because it's been right, it's decreed, and we're all going to die. And if you think you are going to get out of dying because you're in a palace, you're, you're, dead, you're dead wrong. You and all of your household are going to die as well. And so that's when she said, Okay, ask anybody to fast for me for three days. Three days, don't eat, eat or drink. She didn't say ask anybody to pray, which is really interesting because I see no request for prayer. But I don't see God showing up in a miraculous way, except he, he, he's there, but he's not showing himself. All the situations that, that are there, God is showing himself, but not physically, not personally. He's not speaking. There's no miracle happening. And there's no mention of, of Jerusalem. There's no mention of the temple. There's no mention of the law. There's no mention of prayer. And so you, you see uh, some of the people who, who, who uh, have canonized Esther in the scriptures have wondered, you know, does it even belong there because there's no mention of God? But in fact, it does belong there. And um, what does it have to do with us? <clears throat> there's, there's a few things. First, it's not coincidental that Mordecai has overheard two of the king's guards plotting the king's execution. The fact that Mordecai was in the right place at the right time to stop the king's assassination was really important for the future of the Jews. Esther is another example of God having his person in the right place at the right time. The edict from the king himself had gone out to destroy the Jews. God had people in the right place at the right time in your life and in mine. And sometimes we wonder, where is God? I, 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 I'm in this bad situation. Where is God? And, and you don't see his activity. 
but you know it's there. And God's promise to preserve his people, okay? If God had allowed this to happen, the Jews would have been literally annihilated. They'd have been wiped out, okay? Because uh, the kingdom extended over 127 provinces. So what happens? She asks for them to fast. They fast. And on the day of the, the feast, she goes in and tells the king. And the king puts Mordecai to death. Or no, I'm not sorry, Mordecai, but Haman to death on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. But what does it mean for the Jews? The king can't undo the decree that he's written. He can't just cancel it. So he asks her, what would you have me to do? Because he can't undo the law that he's already had in place. And so Mordecai and Esther come up with, you know what? Give the Jews the opportunity to defend themselves. When they have the arrived, the Jews, if anybody tries to hurt them, that they're allowed to defend themselves and their property and their family. The king said, so be it. He took off his signet ring and he, and he gave it to Mordecai. He set out an edict, and the edict went out to all 127 provinces that on this particular day, which was still about seven, eight months yet future, all the Jews had permission of the king to defend themselves and their property from any attacks or anybody tries to harm them. Okay? So you have, and then he sends out everybody that he can to get the word And I'm trying to think, Lord, what, what is it you're trying to say to us about this day? And I believe this day that he's speaking of is a day that is coming in everybody's lives is about to be right now. And the message it needs to be taken out hurriedly and quickly by the present day church, the, the saints in the New Testament, is that there's judgment coming and God, is, God loves you and there's a way for you to escape that judgment and that judgment is through his son Jesus Christ. And if you will come to Christ today, you can be saved. You can be forgiven from all your sin. Your sin is going to cause you to be in a judgment that you can't get out of before God. There's only one remedy, and that one remedy is the person of Jesus Christ. And so, as the word goes out that they can defend themselves, the day comes, and guess what happens? 75,000 Persians end up being put to death. And all the Jews defended themselves, and they celebrated, and uh, the net result was God was glorified, and uh, God's message to his people today is that if we'll trust him, no matter what's going on in our lives, he will be present, he will be with us, and he will deliver us. He delivered the Jews over and over and over, and he will do the same thing for the people of God today. And that deliverance comes from the Messiah, our Jesus. And so we flee to the cross. We flee to the Son of God who, who gave his life for us. And he is our remedy. He is our defense. He is our intercessor. He is our advocate. He is the only one who is able to save us. Uh, Mordecai, you could say, was a type of Christ, perhaps, in that he got the word out and, and caused the people to, to uh, prepare themselves for that day of battle. And today, hundreds of years later, uh, the Jews still celebrate that particular day in their history. It's called the, uh, the Feast of Purim or the, the, the Feast of, the, uh, uh, of Lots. Okay, Pur, Pur is Lot and Im is plural. Purim, the casting of lots. The very thing that uh, Haman intended for evil, God brought it about for good for his people. So when you're in, you're in a situation that you feel like there's no solution, Esther thought there was no solution. The, the, cho uh, the children of, uh, uh, in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know what? <laughs> Our God's able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. Haman, or, I'm sorry, Mordecai wasn't going to bow, right? And so, so it is. Esther said, all right, I'll go in, but you fast for me first. He, and she said, if I perish, I perish. If he puts me to death, I'll die. She was willing to die so that her people, millions of the Jews, their lives would be spared and that this thing could be undone. And it was undone by the grace of God and by the power of God and by the presence of God and by the person of Christ. And so 
no matter what situation we're in. It sounds, it seems dire, it seems impossible. God is a God of the impossible, and God is a God of salvation. He saved the Jews, and he'll save anyone who comes to him today if they come with a repentant heart and ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Lord God, as we consider, Lord, what you did for the Jews so many years ago, 2,500 years ago, Lord, we're reminded there's still the people of your choosing. There's still the apple of your eye. And Lord God, we know that you're going to preserve them all the way through the tribulation period and beyond. Lord, because they are your people. Lord, we are your people here today. Lord, we go through difficulties. We go through struggles. Lord God, we go through problems and trials. And Lord, sometimes we feel like, where is God? And, and Lord, we know that your word promises us that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And yet, Lord, uh, we, we just rest on the promise, God, that you're going to be uh, going to battle for us and that we're more than conquerors through, through you, Lord. And if you're for us, who can be against us? Lord, we pray for the, the people and the nation of Israel today. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray, God, for your people, that they would come to the knowledge that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah, their Messiah, and that you would open their eyes, Lord, that they might place their trust and faith in you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray for your church today. God, we pray that you might bring healing and rebuilding, and Lord God, that you would just help your church to advance in this, in this day and age, Lord, at the end of this age, Lord, so that people will hear the gospel before for them it's too late. Lord, help us to get the message out, even as they got the message out to the Jews and they, they went to every province, Lord. God, help us to go into all the ends of the earth, starting at home and then moving abroad to take the gospel, the message of salvation through Jesus to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take your hymnal this morning and turn to number three, 379? 428. I need thee every hour. Number 428.